On today's episode, I spoke with Mark Huber about generalists, marketing strategy versus execution, and customer evidence. Mark is the VP of marketing at User Evidence and has worked across tons of different marketing roles, which we'll touch on. And in this episode, you're going to learn the pros and cons of being a marketing generalist, why some companies get stuck on strategy, and how you can start collecting user evidence today. So let's dive right into this episode. So let's let's start off by giving you a chance to introduce yourself so we can get to know what you're working on, where you really specify uh, right now, at least what you're working on. So if yep. you wouldn't mind just bullet points of your career up to this point, and yep. then what you're working on now. Yeah, so bullet points. They look like a bunch of random bullets in different facets of marketing. I started as a consultant at Accenture right out of school and then left after two years to basically bop around at different startups doing very different things from digital marketing to marketing operations to demand gen to growth to brand and product marketing all the way to where I'm currently at right now as a VP of marketing at User Evident. So it rounded out my perspective of how to build a really high performing B2B marketing org. Uh, so I'm pretty thankful. I'm a deep generalist, I like to say. As far as what I'm working on right now, a lot of presentation work at the moment, but really revising what our Q2 and Q3 plan is for marketing at user evidence and really trying to figure out how can we create more pipeline uh, and more efficiently, regardless of you know whether it's inbound or outbound events to referrals, and then really standing up more uh, experiments. So it's a real big focus for the marketing team uh, in Q2 and beyond. I want to I want to touch on this idea of, of you being like a generalist all over the place because there are kind of like two types of marketers. Mm -hmm. One's like you, where you tried a little bit of everything, maybe found something you liked and leaned into it, or, or yep. forced into it, whatever. Then there's some that just kind of knew, oh, I wanted to be an SEO the whole time. Yeah, uh, I think that's maybe rare at this point. But in your experience as a generalist, yeah. having all these different spots, like what are you? I want to go through the pros and cons. Maybe we start with the pros of why you think it was awesome for your career to yeah. be more of a generalist. Yep. And then and then the flip side we can go in afterwards, like why why has that not been the greatest? Yeah. So I'll kind of tell a funny story. So there was a a hot minute where I was almost headed down the like specialist path. Uh, I was studying for the Marketo Certified Expert exam in probably would have been like 2017, 2018. And I liked marketing ops, but the more that I was studying for that certification, I kept thinking to myself, I was like, I don't really want to do this. Like, this isn't where I want to, to specialize in. So it was at that moment where I was like, all right, you know, you don't have to go down this route. You can keep trying other things and, and really do the work yourself, you know, at that particular company outside of what was in my job description to say, hey, I was already doing this. So that when the time came around for a new job uh, for me to interview with, I could already say, hey, I, I've done this, even though it's not in my job title. As far as what I like about it, I think because I've done stints in all of these different functions for like two to three years at a time, I can go pretty deep in each of these different areas. You know, I'm not a specialist in any of them by any means, but I like to use the college course analogy of like 101 to 401 level. I'd say for most of these things, I'm at like a 201 or 301 level and I love it. It's exciting It because I've been in the seat before and I've done a lot of these things. I can have more credible conversations with people that I hire or agencies and freelancers that I bring on. So it's fun. I like the variety. And I think that really stems from being in consulting right out of school and just liking, you know, doing so many different things and, uh, you know, feeling kind of like. You don't know what you're doing when you first start something and then you surprise yourself with how quickly you can pick it up. Yeah. Flip side though, like in what way, are there any stories or instances throughout your career where you do wish that you just had that deep understanding in one area in particular? Honestly, no, like I, <laughs> I respect the question. I just think that, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a specialist. People enjoy doing that. If you really want to stay in that lane, I enjoy what I've done to date. I think at times, you know, are there certain moments where, you know, I'm doing a particular thing and, and wish that, oh, I, you know, would have really paid attention to how to set up all these like technical uh, workflows and HubSpot sometimes. But then I remind myself, it's like, I don't really enjoy doing that. So uh, I would say if anything, there are moments when I'm doing any sort of like reporting uh, or uh, like workflows uh, in HubSpot. I can only get so far, but uh, that's why I find really smart freelancers to help fill my gaps. Totally. Um, with, um, with that, I'm just curious, like, 
So it sounds like there was a moment there where marketing ops might have been the thing. Quickly became like, now I'm just gonna keep keep trying everything. Um, I'm wondering if that would change now. Like if you were starting your career over now, mm -hmm. and you were gonna consider a trendier thing or a more more modern thing. I mean, marketing ops is still obviously super relevant, mm -hmm. but would that still be the thing where maybe you would go that direction if you were gonna specialize, or is there a new channel or or yeah, marketing function that you would be like, I think this is the way marketing is going. Yeah. So I've never been asked this question. So I'm going to pause here and, and think of a good answer. I would say, and I dabble with a lot of these, you know, new AI tools out there. I think there are technical parts of marketing that are going to be a hundred percent automated using a lot of these like AI tools and they're already starting to head in that direction. So I think for me, if I were to be little Mark 12 years ago, coming out of school and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I think I would really focus on the creative side of marketing and not like, you know, creative agencies and design and development, all that stuff. I think, uh, writing in particular, uh, and then, um, basically using that as a way to get into product marketing or something that like AI really can't do well, uh, at this moment, because I think creativity is still going to be the huge differentiator for marketers and B2B like five years from now and 10 years from now. And AI just can't do that right now. I completely agree. And, and on that note, what percentage of, uh, of your job right now, would you say is writing? Like what percentage uh, total you think you just spend writing? I would say probably like, I mean, there's a lot of new responsibilities that I get as a VP. So, uh, VP responsibilities aside, I'd say probably half of my time. And then with the VP responsibilities, like half of it is really presentations and, and persuading people and, and influencing people. And sometimes that's using, uh, you know, verbal communication, but many times it's using written communication. So it still comes back to writing. Yeah. I think, I think your point about going into something creative makes a ton of sense because AI can get you, you know, some of the way there for a lot of different things, but not all the way there for pretty much anything and mm -hmm. writing especially i think gets you even not not nearly as far along and your ability to think and then translate that on paper and, and then that comes through in a pitch deck comes through yep. in a presentation to wherever or actually writing content or whatever it is so that that's that's truly a skill we don't even it's the most obvious skill for marketers but the one we don't, we don't even talk about it as much like hey just become a good writer people don't think about it nearly as much as they should and i think the more I, i've always enjoyed writing there was a moment in high school where i kind of thought you know hey i'd love to be a sports journalist and then i think it was my dad who basically said like you know they really don't make any money and it's really really hard to be a sports journalist and i was like okay you're probably right here but the more that I started to write, you know, on the side and just by posting on LinkedIn and whatnot, it made me a better writer uh, just from repetition and doing it over and over and over again. And I can't recommend that enough to anyone who's trying to break into B2B marketing or just level up their writing right now. It's, it's a total chicken and egg thing where if you're not good at writing, you get better by writing more. And then that good stuff just happens when you write. And it's just this cycle. Yeah that you keep getting, you become a better marketer, then you become a better writer and it just like keeps flowing through. Uh, I want to shift gears just a tiny mm -hmm. bit. And it, one, one of your taglines is this idea of how you, you don't just make a marketing strategy, you turn a big, a big ideas, big strategy into actual action, into execution. And I know that I've seen my fair share of companies I work with or, you know, clients I've helped or whatever, that they kind of know the strategy they want to do, but for some reason, the execution side just doesn't click for tons of companies. It's like coming up with a thing and actually doing the thing are disparate elements for so many people. I'm curious what you think about that. Like, why do you think companies struggle with the execution side? Because it's harder. I think everybody has ideas. It's how well can you execute those ideas? And more importantly, how quickly can you start executing them and learning from them? I think for me, one of the things that I struggled with earlier in my career is I was always trying to be like perfect in whatever I launched, like everything needed to be perfect or else I didn't feel comfortable launching it. And that in time would take longer and nothing is ever perfect. So I think for me, I really learned that at my last company of just really the importance of getting stuff out into market fast and learning and seeing what kinds of positive or negative feedback that you're getting and then iterating on it and uh, how I've really changed my perspective on just marketing in general. I'm 
so, so big on just shipping V1s and being very clear of like, hey, this is a V1, but we already have an eye on what the V2 or V3 will look like. So at user evidence, really with any big thing that I've done and had to pitch the co-founders on, say, hey, this is a V1. This is what it's going to look like. This is what the V2 will look like. And then this is the V3. So, you know, we're going to start small, but we still have an eye in the future. And it goes a, a very long way when, you know, you can pitch that to your founders and get approval uh, because they know you're already thinking about what you're going to tinker with and, and add next. Well, for, for your experience at user evidence right now, what mm -hmm. do you think the, the percentage split is between how much time you spend on strategy versus like executing on the thing? Yeah, I would say probably like 30, 40% strategy and the rest on execution. I, I would imagine it's, it's flipped a lot of places too. I, I know I've seen that for sure. You just, you, you talk about basically an MVP mindset for any given project, anything that you're shipping. Mm -hmm. um, companies want to do that, but then it still ends up being like 70, 80% time spent writing docs. Yep. And then when you, when you go to execute, pre really prevalent content marketing where it's like, we're going to write all these blogs you, you, and then you write the blogs and spend no time promoting them or doing anything with them. Like that's a totally different can of worms. And I couldn't agree more because so many people are just focused on the, if you build it, they will come content and spoiler, that doesn't work. Like you got to spend way more time on the distribution around it. What, well, right now in your role, are there any, any, um, examples of like, what we, what we just talked about is content versus distribution. Like mm -hmm. any, any other instances of that that you're kind of going through right now where it's like, Oh, we're finding all these different ways to actually execute on this thing and promote this thing or whatever, as opposed to focusing on the strategy. Yeah, I think the first idea that comes to mind is the show that I launched in February called The Proof Point. So we are, I think, seven or eight episodes in right now. We're releasing every other week. And we're at a point where we've realized that we've really started to hit a second gear in the quality of each episode and the content being created. We get unbelievable qualitative feedback from the right titles at, you know, the, our target accounts. And we know that it's landing, which for us is like, all right, the show is good. Now we just need to figure out better ways of distributing it and repurposing it than we already are today. So I think for us, that's like a huge opportunity that uh, I need to prioritize in Q2 and beyond because, you know, just shipping new podcast episodes every week and posting about it one time, people aren't going to find it. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's, that's like a huge, a huge theme going and I'm, I'm glad because why make the thing if, uh, you're not actually going to milk it for all it's worth. Yeah. Any, um, I, I guess as VP marketing right now, I'm not sure if this is like kind of first time being in that role or, or yes, this is something, summer. um, well, I'm sure you, you, you've seen other, you've been close to other VP of the marketing, or you've been around a lot of the work that you're doing now. It's just, it's more and, and it's all at once, but. If you're looking back five years even, so COVID times, pre-AI uh, pre really, mm -hmm. what's different about being in a VP marketing or, be, or just leading marketing strategy in general now versus back then? Yeah, I think a couple things come to mind. It's a really good question too. And I don't say that for a lot of questions that I get asked on podcasts. I would say the struggle to really tie Everything that marketing is doing uh, to pipeline and revenue feels just so much more prevalent today than it probably did five years ago. And then the flip side of that is with so many changes to what types of data you can and cannot capture, it makes it that much more difficult to report out on really what's working and what's not working and being able to quantify everything. So what I've been able to do at user evidence is focus on data capture and, and quantify the things that you can quantify with reasonable confidence. And then for the things that you can't quantify, make sure that you're getting qualitative feedback from target accounts, ICP, your sales team, customers, you name it. I just presented at our last board meeting and one of the slides that I had in my marketing update had a bunch of qualitative feedback on the type of content that we had been creating and the reactions that we've been getting and it landed really well. So you have to really show the full picture in a couple of different ways since you can't quantify everything. You, you're talking about qualitative data. It kind of made me wonder if there are any non-obvious metrics that you care about 
then maybe it's not just like, oh yeah, this is, we're tracking CAC. Like there's the obvious stuff, but then mm -hmm. are there non-obvious metrics that actually really matter for user evidence? I wouldn't say non-obvious metrics. I mean, the, the big metrics that I report out on every single week and month and quarter is, you know, inbound source pipeline, inbound source uh, opportunities, the count of them, how many of them convert to later stage, and then how much revenue is attributed to what marketing is doing at a high level. And then at a secondary level, we drill into, you know, where are all of these opportunities coming from using the data that we do have in HubSpot, but then we also have self-reported attribution. And I just created a report to show in our Q2 kickoff that shows, hey, here are all of the things that people are saying about where they hear us. So uh, that's probably the most, I'd say, non-obvious thing that we're looking at today. I do want to give you a chance to talk um, user evidence, custom, you know, the, the mm -hmm. customer evidence um, side of things as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe more on the side of things you talk about pretty often. But um, one, one thing on the show that I try to do is like, you, you'll get the usual, hey, what is the product, all that stuff. But I want to dive like a layer deeper than that mm -hmm. and actually figure out what the thing really looks like. Yep. So for, for the term customer evidence, you, you could probably imagine, make a guess of what that kind of means just with mm -hmm. even out with, without looking at it, then looking at the website, get a better idea. But when you're actually seeing customer evidence in the wild, what does that look like? Yeah, it's just proof that your product actually follows through on the promise that you're selling. And that proof can come in the form of what people typically think, which is case studies and testimonials. But I'm of the belief that I think case studies are probably going to go away in the uh, I would hope in the next three to five years because marketers know how case studies are written. It's usually the vendor who writes the case study. You make it sound like an earth shattering product. You hand pick the craziest outlier success stories and then say, oh yeah, we can increase ROI by 7,000%. <laughs> what we're trying to do with this is, you know, we're surveying your customer base at different points throughout their life cycle so that you can get more credible and believable proof points of how the average customer actually performs. It's kind of an interesting correlation now that I think about it between like a case study and how we're thinking about AI right now, where it's like, oh, I can tell it's written by AI. I don't trust it as much. Mm -hmm. or, or now you get to these things with within marketing where it's, oh, these testimonials, cool, but like I know that they paid for them or I know that they just, you know, it could all be true, but even then it's just not as credible as maybe it, it once seemed. And, and a case mm -hmm. study is a good example of that, which kind of begs the question, when was the last time that you read a case study from somebody else? I'm laughing because I honestly can't tell you. I don't even look at case studies anymore. I, I literally can't even remember if I've, if I've read one. I, I barely read the ones that I've written, I say. Uh, no, I, yeah, I, I like that. And, and finally, somebody kind of calls it out because there's certain parts, certain pieces of content within marketing where it's made a certain way. It's like a sausage factory. You don't really want to know how it's made, but everybody kind of does. And it's not ideal. And Yep. So for, for some of the more, what are, what are some of the creative ways that you've seen people showcasing user evidence? Yeah. So the first few that come to mind are competitive Intel. So creating really curated social proof on why uh, your customers have moved from, you know, one of your competitors to your product. Uh, that can come in a couple different shapes and forms, but we see uh, competitive intelligence as a huge use case for us. Another thing that we see is, you know, the different types of product stats that uh, you can create uh, using user evidence surveys and then pull your customer base. And then you can slice it by industry, role, company size, you name it. So then you're getting, you know, social proof that's a little bit more relevant for each person that might be evaluating your tool. And then the other thing is like use case um, kind of stories of this was the exact use case that I had in um, significantly fewer words than a case study. And, you know, people can see, all right, they had this tool, this tool, and they did this uh, thing with it. And, oh, wait, that's the exact challenge that I have in the tech stack that I have. Uh, and you communicated that in, you know, a couple sentences, not a long, fluffy case study that the vendor wrote themselves. Well, I want to, I want to let us wrap up here and give you a chance at the end to kind of chat mm -hmm. through where people can find you and all that good stuff. But final question here is, yep really just more generally around your, your tooling. Uh, if you had, if you had to pick two to three, let's say MarTech tools that you use all the time and would be super painful if they disappeared, yeah. what would, what would those be? Yeah. So what would I say? We're actually pretty light on tooling right now. Uh, 
it's kind of by design. I like to do things manually first before you really figure out what you actually need to spend money on. But I think for me at user evidence, we use revenue hero for qualification and scheduling and routing on our website. That's been a game changer for us since we've launched it. HubSpot's kind of the default and easy one. I love HubSpot, especially on the CRM side. This is the first time that I've used the CRM and there's just so many easier things that you can do uh, to get the data that you need. And then a non-obvious one, and this is the first time that I've used Notion at user evidence. I've gone really hard on internal documentation and in Notion, and they've re released some cool features where you can like use the AI search and just query what you need. And it will basically look through your entire Notion team space and it'll find you the exact answer. And that has made my life so much easier as a marketing team of two with new agencies and freelancers that we onboard because now I can just share links of all the important things that they care about that we've already documented. Awesome. Well, I, I want to give you a chance to wrap up yourself here where uh, you can you can chat through where people can find you, mm -hmm. what you're working on currently. We've, we've talked about that a bunch, but uh, feel free to, to plug anything that's important to you right now. Yeah. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, make sure you're watching The Proof Point, our show for go-to-market leaders at B2B SaaS companies. And then you can also subscribe to Evidently. It's a new newsletter that I launched. That's different than most newsletters out there because the hook is I'm a first-time VP of marketing and I'm sharing my hits and more importantly, my misses uh, exclusively in that newsletter. And I'm really open and transparent around what I've missed and messed up. And the feedback has been awesome so far. As far as what I'm working on, we've got Q2 kickoff on Monday. So I got to finish all of my Q2 and Q3 OKRs and presenting everything. So uh, I've got a busy Friday afternoon. Godspeed. I appreciate you coming on.